Welcome to Put a Word on It, a podcast presented by Men of Valor. In each episode, we're going to talk with a different man, but each one with a unique journey from brokenness to freedom. I'm your host, Rudy Kalis. I spent over 40 years as a TV sportscaster, then retired and joined the Men of Valor program as a volunteer. So join the conversation. Reconciling men to God, their families and society. Well, thanks for joining us. Another edition of Put a Word on It. Uh, sometimes we think, you know, that you've got to find Christ if you're incarcerated or something young in your life. And we hope that it happens as a young person so you can spend your life with him. But sometimes it happens at an older age. And God has a way of using people even at a different point in life when we think, hey, I'm set in my ways. Nope. I want you to meet a man, Stan Mills, who now has Christ in his heart. And it didn't come as a kid. Stan, in the little time that we talked before this interview, I was so fascinated because a lot of times around guys who are they're incarcerated or they're young, and I found Jesus. And, I'm a, you know, and <laughs> you were about retirement age. Why did it take you so long? And uh, and give me the sense of what happened. That's a really good question, Rudy. Um, I what I called was a country club church. I belonged in a church for years. My kids were baptized there where you'd hear, hear a sermon. Sometimes it was tied to scripture, but for the most part, everybody left the front doors and they were doing their lives just like they did it before they came in. Were you raised in church as a kid growing yes. up? Yes. And that was where? Ne Nebraska? Nebraska, Chicago, Minneapolis, oh, Decatur, Illinois, St. Louis. Moved around. Yeah. Your dad, job situations? Yes. Did you go to church then? Yes, we did. Oh my goodness. But what was that like? I was kind of a rebellion kind of kid. I got thrown out of Sunday school. Um, so I had to sit in church with my folks from the time I was probably eight years old on. But by the time I left for Omaha for Chicago, I was um, junior in high school. So then we moved a lot after that. So I'd just come home from college for the summer break and then I'd attend church with my folks usually. But you probably didn't do it when you weren't around them because, no. you know, all right, I'm here dragging me to church. So nothing in faith really didn't mean anything. To no. You, really. And the people that I hung around with, there was nobody influencing me in that direction. So you're successful, though. You will live your whole life and you work. And then what happens? Well, you can say I was successful, but the Lord had me the whole time. I didn't know it. I People would ask me, how, how did you do this? How did you become successful? I'm like, I don't know. I've got good people around me. I don't know. But after I came to the Lord, I'm like, now I know. He really had his hands on me when I didn't even know it. There's times I should, I could have been in prison easily. I could have been dead in car accidents, motorcycle accidents. Um, I never thought I'd live past 35. Wow. Here I am, 72. So I'm I'm good. What kind of job, what kind of work did you do? I'm a licensed architect. Um, I got fed up with the firm that I was working for and cars were a hobby. My wife called them an obsession. And I started a service station, full service station, full serve service station in 1977. I was 29 years old. Um, I thought it was a sabbatical. I just do it for a while. And then I figure out what I wanted to do because I didn't want to leave Lincoln, Nebraska, because I loved Lincoln. Um, and then one thing led to another. After 19 years in the service station business, I moved into convenience stores. And by the time I retired, I had five convenience stores. Mm. So I sold those out in 17, got married here and moved to Nashville. But that's part of your conversion. Tell me how that comes about. So I think it was when I was about 45 that um, I was at an Amway convention and they had an altar call. And I went down and I thought at that point I was saved. I mean, I, I really believed it. I felt it. Then I went back to Lincoln, Nebraska and fell right back into the same friends, started doing the same things. My wife didn't like the church I liked. So we went back to the church that the kids grew up in. And then in 2017, February, my wife passed away. I met an old acquaintance in St. Louis that June. Um, she shared the gospel with me, had me read scriptures, which I don't think I'd ever done before. 
and I started crying like a baby. I was saved at that point. My life changed and I could reflect back on the things that had happened in my life and I know God was present in those things. What did she say or, or that, that, that flipped the switch? I told her that I didn't understand where all these souls went. I said, there's got to be billions of souls out there. Where are they? Because I didn't know how big God was at that point. Um, she says, do you have a TV set? And I go, yes. She says, do you have a remote control? And I go, of course I do. Do you know how it works? I said, no, it works. So you have faith that it's going to work. And I go, yeah. She says, this is the same thing. You just need to have faith. And it's like, I'm getting goosebumps right now talking about my conversion right now. It was that powerful to me. How did you get involved with Meta Valor? I was remarried. My first wife passed away in February. I remarried the lady that lived down here in June of 17. And in November of 17, I went to a men's meeting at Fellowship Bible Church. And during that meeting, J.R. Davis stood up and talked about men of valor. So there are four other charitable things that were introduced at that meeting. And it started working on me. It was like, you know, I this sounds really interesting to me, but I don't know about these prison guys. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not man enough to handle these guys with the muscles and tattoos and gang members and stuff. And so it took me two months and I called Tevin and I think it was February. They offered me to come into the Men of Valor program and I've loved every minute. I mean, I, I love these guys. They do more for me than I do for them. Oh, that's big. I, I say the same thing. You come every single week. Yeah. Well, it, the consistency is so important to them, isn't it? Yes, it is. And a, a lot of people over the years have have been there for them if they could get something out of them. All these guys seem like they feel like their relationships were built on how somebody could get something from them or how they could get something from somebody else. And so that's it's really hard to restructure that mindset and trust people. It just takes some time. It's fun to watch them. I, I deal mostly with the first 30 day guys mm -hmm. and to watch them come out of prison with a head and facial expression like a stone. And within two weeks, they start to soften up. And after 30 days, they're hugging each other and they're helping each other out, learning scripture. And I mean, it's amazing to me when I'm in class with them and they'll volunteer to help somebody that came in new the day before that they don't even know. You know, I'll tell you how to do the F-260. I'll tell you what's going on with the purple book. I'll tell you about the memory verse, the covenant for men of valor. I mean, and these guys help them out. It's so much fun to get to know these guys and experience what they're going through um, in this program, in this ministry. God had a plan for you all along and got you to that point. Our program has put a word on it. Can you think of a word that that's uh, significant to you? You know, it's uh, love. Wow. I love these guys. Um, and it's love was not something that I really understood. I mean, I understood love for my kids and my family, but I didn't necessarily love other people. I was really isolated. I did not want anybody to know anything about me. I was safe as long as nobody could challenge me on anything. I just did what I kept my head down, did what I needed to do. I didn't want accolades. I didn't want to be in the news. I wouldn't answer phone calls from the paper or the TV or anything. I didn't want anybody to know anything about me. But now it's like I share everything about me. When you run into somebody on the street and you really care for them, it blows them away. They think it's fake, but after they get to know you, they know it's not. Mm. Stan, you have a gentleness that I can see the guys really get drawn to. It's just, a, it's gotta be a wonderful blessing to know Thank that you, God could use you. Thank you very much. So let's put a word on it, love. I'm never sure what they're going to say. So when he says love, you oh, that's so simple. No, it's not simple. It's the root of everything. God so loved us and loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to us. And for him to think that way, and I love the fact that he said, I love these guys. I feel that way about the guys that we spend time with inside the prison. And they sure need somebody like Stan when they come out 
to get that love and feel that love as they begin their journey through the rest of their lives. So a wonderful story from Stan Mills. Thanks for joining us and join us again next time for Put a Word Out.